I think Emerson is trying to produce a kind of therapy. He and Thoreau are basically provide an indictment of our lives and an invitation to live a better life. So it's not just a discussion, at least on the face of it, of, of philosophical problems in a narrow sense. It's a discussion of how we live every day. And to give you an example of the kind of thing Emerson says, he characterizes us in the American scholar, for example, as living lives of bugs or spawn or living in a herd. It sounds like the existentialists, and uh, it is uh, like the existentialists. He also talks in self-reliance about our uh, living lives of apology. We're always apologizing for ourselves. We're ashamed of ourselves. We skulk, that's his word, skulk and sneak through the world. So he has this image of us as conformists and as fearful. And somehow his writing is supposed to, can't really change us in any automatic way, but I think it's supposed to, it's meant to get us to think about our lives and look at ways in which we might change them. So again, I think he is really concerned with how one lives one's life, which is uh, what those self-help people are also involved with and also what the Greek philosophers are involved with. So, uh, and what we're all involved with. Some of the people who are concerned about how you live your life, they want to tell you how to do it. And I think these philosophers want you to come up with it for yourself. Otherwise, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. Emerson has a very direct way of putting this in self-reliance. He says, Imitation is suicide, and he really means if you, if you imitate, you're dead or you're killing yourself. And so the contrary of that is the only way to be alive, uh, the only way to, to really live is not to imitate. But then how do you do that? That is really a problem, especially if you realize that imitation, as he understands it, can be an imitation of yourself. The task that he suggests for us without telling us how to do it, this task of not being an imitator, which is another word for self-reliance, is really quite a difficult task, not an easy thing at all. The message to do your own thing, which is pretty much what Emerson says, um, do your work and I shall know you, is a quote from one of his writings. There can be various degraded forms of that message and various degraded ways of following it out. That's certainly not what Emerson is, is uh, counseling. He always indicates this. I just quoted, do your work and I shall know you. So it's the second part that makes it public. And also, there's an exactly parallel statement at the beginning of self-reliance where he says something like, if you dive down into the most secret presentiment of your thought, you will find that you make universal sense. So the, the more that you do your own thing, the more it's going to make sense to everybody else. And you can, he has some very clear examples. I mean, he thinks Shakespeare, Napoleon, he's got a bunch of different examples. Goethe, Montaigne, Plato, Jesus, Moses, all the great uh, men and women that we remember who have a force in our culture did their own thing. And the more they did their own thing, the less they were imitators, the more they make sense to us. So you could almost say, contrary to what you might think, that the more you do your own private thing, the more you find your own private thought, your own genius, to use another one of Emerson's words, the more it will make sense to everybody. And so if you're making sense only to yourself, you're not really doing your own thing. You're imitating or you're, you're not thinking. So for him, this is one of the interesting and fascinating things about, about Emerson, that there's all this emphasis on the self and self-reliance and self-development and don't imitate and society is in conspiracy against you. But the payoff for departing from what society tells you to do is that it, you'll make sense to society. And he sees this instantiated in uh, or exemplified in the lives of uh, great writers and artists. When you're really doing your own thing, everybody will say, look at that, I know, it's amazing. If people aren't 
noticing you, and if you're not making sense to people, the solution to that is not to talk like everybody else or to do what everybody else is doing. It's to find that thing that you can do, and then, then you will be comprehensible to others. Thoreau and Emerson are pretty much ignored by uh, philosophy departments, and they're taught in literature departments, though they're considered a little odd. Emerson and Thoreau are not cited by the pragmatists, so they're not really considered, except by some, to be part of that tradition. The only people I know of who are famous and philosophers who've ever paid any attention to Emerson are John Dewey. It's part of my argument for the link. Dewey wrote a really great but short uh, appreciation of Emerson in 1903 on the 100th anniversary of his birth. And Friedrich Nietzsche, who wrote that Emerson was perhaps the greatest philosopher of the 19th century and was very close to him. So you have Emerson taken up by Nietzsche in some way, by Dewey, but that was a long time ago. Nietzsche died in 1900 and Dewey didn't do that much with Emerson. And so Emerson has sort of been left there to have find his readers, but not to be paid attention to by professional philosophers. It, it was a revolutionary move I think when Cornell West in, 1990, in 1989 wrote The American Invasion of Philosophy and started A Genealogy of Pragmatism was his subtitle, but the first chapter was on Emerson. It was a revolutionary move to say, well, Emerson is part of this tradition too. I think the American philosophers play with their Americanness. They notice that they're Americans. Emerson writes this, gives this address called The American Scholar. And he does seem to be calling for something new to happen here in America. But the American scholar is almost hardly about America. The title might promise that it's about America, but again, it's really about uh, waking up and doing something original and not being discouraged, being courageous and of good cheer. That's what it's about. On the nationalism of it, we just the other day finished his essay, Manners, which sounds like it's about how you hold your fork or something, but it's actually about being noble. It's about being a hero, a gift giver, an overflowing source of inspiration. And at the end of this essay uh, by this American writer published in 1844, Manners, he's got Islam showing up. He's got the Quran, he's got Shiraz, he's got the Shah of Shiraz, and a beggar named Osman, who's at the gates of the city, who is much richer than the Shah, who is serene and sunny, and who by the sort of attraction of his own character brings all the sickness of the world to him. So I was in, in our contemporary engagement with Islam in its more you know, unpleasant aspects, I was struck by seeing in Emerson, who was a great reader of Persian poetry, for example, really placing at the center of his ideal an image from the Middle East or from Persia. This actually shows up also in his great essay, Experience, where he talks, actually, it's a great conjunction, and this is relevant, I think, to the question of America, because in the essay, Experience, Emerson talks about this new yet unapproachable America I have found in the West. Paradoxical statement. New, unapproachable, I have found it. But so, New Yet Unapproachable America. And then within a few sentences of that image of the New Yet Unapproachable America that he has found, he talks about the sunbright Mecca of the desert, opening up to the, with this, again, the heart is in there. So in Emerson's mind, I don't know, somehow Emerson and America and Mecca and, and Osman in the gates, uh, sitting the poor beggar at the, the gates of Shiraz, all sort of come together. So I think Emerson also, like Whitman, contains multitudes. And maybe this is America too, because America is the melting pot famously. And I think Emerson thought of himself as a world. You know, he, he wanted the riches of the world and wanted to uh, absorb them and produce something from them. So America is just part, part of it, I would say.